Okay, so now I'm going to try to give this talk. And uh, <laughs> the slides aren't finished yet, and the work isn't finished yet, but anyway, let's have a, let's try. So this is about uh, an n much less than p problem, and actually not a big data problem, but a small data problem, because there are going to be about 40, pay, 40 uh, uh, observations, and some of much more than 40 uh, uh, variables. So uh, actually two data sets, two, two small spreadsheets, each with 40 rows and 40 plus columns. And it's about Corona, and in particular about the treatment which uh, Donald Trump and others have been so enthusiastic about, hydroxychloroquine. You can also find it in your garden shed if you have got a pond for cleaning your aquarium. Uh, and I wouldn't drink the stuff in the, you find in your garden shed. Okay, and I call this HCQ cocktail because with, with what is being touted is the combination of hydroxychloroquine, uh, anti-malarial uh, medicine, uh, azithromycin, that's an antibiotic, and a zinc supplement. Okay, now these uh, the slides you see here are on my home page. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, let's see if I can draw. Yes, there's my home page, and uh, these slides are near the top. And I hope in a short time there will also be a paper, and also uh, some two data sets, so you can see what you can do for the same thing. Okay, I have been working with a number of people, and in particular I want to mention uh, Lila Schnapps here, famous pure mathematician from Paris. Not really a statistician, but who's very enthusiastic about hydroxychloroquine. And uh, she's the one who got me into this because she was very impressed by the doctors in Marseille who Didier, these people, Coutray, Rao, and others, who uh, were the, f uh, the ones who, uh, whose publication, whose very early publications influenced, uh, uh, influenced Trump <laughs> and Macron. And since then, there's been a huge uh, political uh, uh, story going on, as well as a medical story. Okay, I've also been working with two young people, and uh, one of them here on the left is uh, Hoang Van Tuan, Tuan. So Tuan is really his first name. Hoang is his family name. He's a young Vietnamese uh, doctor, working as a PhD student in Marseille, and uh, calls himself an epidemiologist which means he knows some pretty elementary statistics. He's a very bright uh, guy and a good guy. Uh, he's no match for his um, French supervisors, Gautre, Rao and others, who are very, very suspicious of statistics and statisticians and uh, are easily able to ignore his sensible advice. And the other young person I've been working with this year, Dipro Mondal, who's a master's student in Leiden, who has a kind of summer project, has been working with me on this. And uh, uh, really, it's his results I want to talk about, only his results are not quite finished yet, so that you won't see them in these slides or in this uh, 10 minutes or however long it is. Okay, well, I already mentioned uh, the people in Marseille, uh, and this. Uh, they have uh, um, supplied, including Zhuang, they have supplied one data set, 40 by 42 or something, uh, or 42 by 40 plus spreadsheet, and here's another, uh, another one. Uh, Rob Aylens is a Dutch uh, family doctor, also alternative medicine guy, who lives and works at the epicenter of the Dutch Corona pandemic and has been treating some of the first Corona patients in the Netherlands and was an early adopter of hydroxychloroquine till he was till the medication was actually forbidden and his doctors were not allowed to prescribe it anymore at least not for Corona you can prescribe it for malaria but not for COVID-19 and so he has some patients who were treated with HCQ and others not, and the 
uh, treatment choice was determined exogenously, I mean by politics, not actually by choice of doctor. So it's almost like a randomized trial. I, need, I had a lot of help from a lot of other people. Okay, let's uh, move on. So here's the general story, which I think is pretty well known. Uh, many people get exposed, some people get infected, some people become infectious, a few people get very badly sick and uh, uh, also suffer long-term irreparable damage from the sickness. And the question is whether this medication could be useful as a prophylactic, or in other words as a preventive means to stop the illness from getting hold of you. And there it is a plausible explanation of why it should work and some experience and uh, what was successful against uh, SARS, which is also a corona infection. So who knows? And the problem is we don't know. Here's a little calculation, which I'm not going to go into now, but you can read them on the site. Very simple calculation. So we would need about more than a thousand patients in, uh, in a treatment group, in a control group, in order to find out whether this really does help because if we are going to be giving it to people in the very early stages of the illness possibly not even with the illness and possibly with the illness but they're not going to get sick of it anyway uh, we want to compare a small probability to a po hopefully even smaller probability and we're going to need a huge sample size to be able to see if there's any difference or not and uh, a, a thousand would be good 40 is useless, but perhaps not totally useless. So indeed, uh, these two early, uh, two early studies had n equals 40 and had spectacular positive results. And of course, because they were spectacular positive results, they got published and they got attention. And one can imagine that there were other people who tried out this and who tried out other things and did not have spectacular positive results, and we never heard about them again. So there can certainly be a selection bias in these two studies. Uh, my, own, my own is not actually a study, there's no publication, but Marseille led to an early publication uh, and led to a big impact. Okay, here are the Marseille people and their, and their paper, which uh, I think appeared as a preprint in about uh, uh, April, possibly even already in March. <coughs> And uh, there's some statistics in there, and the statistics is done by Juan van Truan. And I think there's some problems with the statistics which are done, which were done. Anyway, here's my own uh, uh, analysis of the Marseille data seen as a two by two table with uh, 26 plus 16, 42 patients here, 26 in the treatment group, uh, 16 in the control group. And there is a very significant uh, result, uh, a, a heart, a heart or 0 0.004 is half of 1%, p-value of a half of 1%, odds ratio of 10. There is a big difference between these two groups. <laughs> There's a big problem. The treatment is confounded by clinic because the treatment patients are all at the clinic in Marseille. Uh, run by Didier Rao and uh, the control patients come from nearby clinics or medical centers in Nice or I think also in Ion Provence. Uh, okay, from close by and the doctors uh, tell us that they are very similar uh, uh, and there are some statistical indications that they're not terribly different but well there's, there's not enough patients to see if there's a big difference or not and uh, there is certainly a big difference in the outcome of these two groups, but uh, whether it's due to the treatment or simply because the clinic in Marseille has got a nice color scheme on the walls or something, we just don't know. Um, the paper itself had only n equals 36, so six patients were omitted, and they were omitted because they did not comply with the treatment. And a couple of treated patients got so sick so fast that they moved to intensive care and were not given hydroxychloroquine anymore so they did not complete the treatment well i don't think that's a good reason to remove them and i really strongly feel 
that there should have been an ITT analysis, intention to treat analysis. And that's uh, uh, my little analysis here is ITT, because of the six patients who withdrew for one reason or another, I have, we more or less know what their situation was after six days, or we have a very good guess of it. And a few, it's very bad, and a few, it's very good. And I put them back in this little analysis. Uh, the paper has got a, a, a smaller p-value, still right, here, one in a thousand. And I think that's uh, very, very misleading. And his Bayesian analysis, which shows that those p-values are probably very misleading anyway, uh, suppose we start off being somewhat sceptical and allow 50% chance that there's a priori that there's no difference between the two groups. Well, and if there is a difference, it could be a good difference or it could be a bad difference. It's, it's a sort of a vague uh, prior, somewhat non-informative prior saying the difference is the log odds ratio could be plus or minus one or maybe even plus or minus two, but not terribly much more. That seems to me to be very reasonable. Uh, posterior, given the data, there is still 8% chance that there's no difference between the two groups. That the, what the difference which we observe is just chance. So that data does not give a strong indication that the treatment is really good. And that's uh, before we start to try to, to account for the known, the many known confounders, which we do know something about. Uh, in Mayo, in the uh, south of the Netherlands, we have basically the same story, and I can be pretty fast here. We have 40 patients. We have an <coughs> estimated odds ratio of infinity because uh, the 10 treated patients will got better. But actually, with the same prior, we end up still uh, having to admit that there's 12% chance, 12% chance that the difference we saw was purely due to chance. So this is not, these numbers are extreme and they were so extreme that <laughs> Dr. Aylens got a lot of attention in the media, but they're not extreme enough to prove anything. Well, there are many confounders. We know age and sex are very important, both of them. We know various existing conditions or comorbidities are very important. Uh, we know that the severity and the duration of various symptoms which patients may be showing when they present uh, tell us something about how sick they're going to get. Uh, but we could have guessed that in advance and we now know it for certain. And there are many more things we know are relevant but we are not measured here. But the first group here, uh, these ones, uh, we have for those 2 times 40 patients, we have those covariates. So we could take account of them, and we will try to see what comes out then. Okay, I've uh, said everything which is on this slide. I've said everything which is on this slide. I've said everything which is on this slide. Uh, here's a little power calculation which says that if we were able to perfectly match pairs of patients so that we didn't need to actually quantitatively take account of covariates, we would take account of them by matching, then we would still need about 200 pairs so we're 400 patients to be able to show that there is a the difference which we expect that to be, which we hope that to be, I should say, uh, to find out whether it's there or not at all. And so 20 twins, 40 patients with knowing the confounders, knowing the covariates is just not going to be enough to prove anything. But I think it could still be uh, an indication of something. Okay, that slide I've already discussed. And uh, of course, I did try logistic regression, both frequentist and Bayesian, put in various uh, covariates, or, uh, try various combinations. Uh, a, a few models with a very small number of covariates give sensible looking results with a strong effect. effects of treatment. Mm -hmm. The two groups are, seem different after you've taken account of age and sex and a few other things. Uh, if you try to automatically do a model selection with a lasso, then <laughs> the results are crazy. It, nearly everything is thrown away and nothing is left. And there's no data left to uh, validate the model selection done by the lasso. 
if you put in what seems to be reasonable to put in, you get crazy coefficients with huge standard errors or even a total numerical breakdown. Um, it's not much helped by putting informative priors on the effect sizes or directions of those variables. And it seems pretty hopeless that we can do anything at all. But I do have an idea and that which that we should be able to do something because we do know a great especially now in retrospect we know a lot more about this sickness and we know that your age and your sex and whether or not you have alzheimer or a heart problem uh, have a very big impact on how sick you are going to get with corona if you do get it so uh, we could uh, and and in fact we know that your your chance of dying of corona this year is very close to your chance of dying this year full stop without corona what it would have been uh, so for young people nothing much has changed uh, for an old person like me it's twice what it was which is was okay uh, i don't know what my risk of death is that would have been this year maybe one in a hundred or one in ten somewhere between and uh, that same risk has got added because of corona being around but okay we know how to uh, we know that risk we can an insurance company calculates that risk for you and there are studies which uh, uh, do it so we can combine all those variables in advance age sex and comorbidities to, to one corona effective age okay then fit it with spline curve with maybe four coefficients four parameters and uh, we don't have a model selection problem any there anymore similarly other studies tell us how uh, severely ill people already are given the, um, various uh, uh, symptoms which they may or may not suffer and how long they suffered them we can use that to combine all the symptoms variables into one and then we just have two continuous covariates which summarize all that information and we have the treatment effect and we should be able to uh, fit a logistic regression model with two continuous covariates and one dichotomous uh, treatment variable uh, use, uh, use of spine curves and uh, the data should be able to tell us something and that's what we're doing and so far the results are looking very favorable and in particular the first part the effect of your corona effective age uh, is looking very very promising indeed and still and showing those two studies are showing that when we take account of the, your corona effective age still there's a big difference between being treated the patients who were treated with hydroxychloroquine and those who weren't and it's the same difference as we saw right in the beginning so those trials were maybe not so misleading after all uh, and it fits to all the other stuff we nowadays know but it's not finished yet it will be finished soon my conclusion is just that we need a big randomized clinical trial with at least a thousand uh, patients and we should be able to take care of the known confounders uh, and we don't have to do a lot of work all over again but with any a thousand there's not so much problem to learn the effect of age yet again but uh, I'm saying it's not, necess not necessary to do that yet again. Um, it's clear that doctors have got to learn not to fear statisticians, and statisticians have got to learn to be able to speak up to doctors. Both sides need to get their act together, and they need to get collaborating. Uh, in the last uh, slides, I've got some pictures and some web pages, and I can very quickly go through them. Uh, now, it's a sort of a rogues gallery. Uh, certainly though Rob Ellens is a very decent guy who's working very hard and Didier Rao is a genial virologist and doctor and I don't agree with all his opinions about statisticians but uh, his the group work of his group and his clinic is very very important and doesn't needs to be uh, taken account of on the left hand side you see some uh, people in America uh, here are some uh, slides of various websites uh, a trial did start uh, and it stopped rather fast as you can see here it closed early because 
the study had only enrolled 20 participants after a month and there was just no point in continuing and that is so sad. Uh, Dr. Fauci tells us that hydroxychloroquine is not good as a treatment, and, uh, but we know that. We know it's not good as a treatment if you're badly ill. It may be good as prophylactic, and that we do not know yet. Uh, here's a nice paper arguing for further investigation of that question and pointing to a couple of uh, important studies which suggest that the uh, prophylactic or preventive effect could be significant and medically important. Here's uh, analysis of the data of Dr. Zelenko, <coughs> where he's been joined by a couple of German medical doctors. I haven't looked at this one in detail yet. Of course, they find a big effect. Uh, this is uh, a, a paper which is often used to say why why the treatment is a waste of time. The c conclusion generally drawn is it shows there's does the, the medication does nothing. Well, actually, 12% with treated, uh, only 12% went on to get seriously ill, whereas the, in the placebo group it was 14.5%. And this only tested hydroxychloroquine and not hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin plus zinc. This uh, study is very much in line, the results are very much in line with the expectations I showed you right in the beginning and uh, basically tells us nothing. It tells us that there may be a small effect and the small effect may be big enough to be important but we don't know and this study doesn't tell us any new Here's a new study just starting and it's uh, planned to be uh, big enough and hopefully that will could lead to some clear conclusions. And that seems to be the end. So this is where I'm going to stop the report.